Comedian Liz Glazer is back on the program. And if you remember her from episode 21, she is a former law professor turned stand up comedian, very smart and kind woman. And she has a new stand up special out May 12th titled A Very Particular Experience that is very funny and also emotional and very powerful. So we're going to talk about the special, her Twitter getting hacked, winning comedy competitions, social media success, and much, much more coming right up. Oh, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. This is nice. I remember the first time we did a podcast, it was on the phone and, uh, that's why I thought it was that. And then I, you know, didn't see the zoom. Yeah. Wow. This is the most low energy I've ever seen you. Are you okay? Yeah. (laughs) Usually you're just like bouncing off the walls. Like, Hey, how's it going? Like, Oh yeah. No, I mean, I'm fine. Um, I haven't had coffee yet. I don't know that coffee is like the reason for my energy. Maybe it's possible. (laughs) I just remember that story about you doing the 18 shots of espresso. (laughs) Yes. I mean, that's, that's accurate. Um, yeah. Thank you for reminding me of that. I needed to be reminded of that. Yeah. Well, I listen. I was listening to a podcast and I heard that story and I was like, wow, that's crazy. And then I was like, wait, that sounds kind of familiar. I was like, I think we talked about this on the other. So then I listened to our first podcast. I was like, oh yeah, we did talk about that. I was like, yeah, that was a cool story. Um, I was going to ask you though. I was looking at your Twitter. Is your Twitter hacked? Yeah. I mean, so it's like, I, I was told that I've been tweeting about cryptocurrency like once an hour. And I'm like, anyone who knows me would know I would only do that once a day, but yeah, I was like, saw one. I was like, this doesn't seem, and then I kept looking, no. I was like, okay, she got hacked. Like, I was like, I, she's tweet crypto. Like what? Yeah. I'm really confused. Okay. No, no, I, I don't know anything about crypto. I imagine I probably will never know anything about crypto, but I tried to like do the steps of fixing it, but it takes, it seems a while if ever. Hmm. Yeah. But I, I, I've been like going through the email steps to fix it. Uh, do you know how that happened? I feel like that's been happening to more and more people. Yeah, I mean, I don't exactly, but from what I can understand from my end, I got a notification that someone in Lithuania was on my Twitter hmm. and then they changed whoever that might have been, changed the email address associated with the Twitter hmm. so then I couldn't get in to fix it or anything like that. So yeah, it's, I mean, I was never much of a tweeter. So it's not a huge loss, but you know, I'm trying to get it back. Yeah. I feel like that's huge for comedians. That's a huge thing. Um, Even for me with a podcast, because if you can get the guest to retweet the episode, like that's how a lot of them get a lot more exposure. See if this person in Lithuania will retweet the episode. (laughs) You never know. Yeah. I mean, maybe if I put it about crypto. Yeah. If I mentioned something about like, and also you could get this cool crypto. Right. It's like your profile picture is like a robot too. Like they're not even trying to hide it. Like I'm surprised they haven't changed your name or whatever. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's like, I don't like, I care kind of, but I think I would care a little bit more if I used Twitter more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, Instagram and uh, YouTube. I know I've seen clips on there a little bit. Facebook. Do you do, are you in, I think you're on TikTok too, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. like, a, is that a big one for, that's like, I feel like that's for most comedians. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that I'm any kind of model in terms of online presence. I kind of just, you know, do enough that like, I feel like I did something and I've tried to be a little more on the ball about it because it's like, okay, well, this is, you know, I'm not trying to like deny the future. I just don't love being online. Really? Why? Um, I don't know. I don't know that I've ever really perceived it to be a connective environment for me. Um, but it's a good question. 
you know, it's just like, I, that was never my thing, um, as a kid really or anything. So yeah, I guess maybe that's why, but I get, I'm not, I, I, I'm trying to, you know what it is like for me with being online, I recognize that it's like the necessary thing for my career. Right. Right. And yeah. so to a degree, I can care about stuff like that, but I'm weird in terms of how I perceive my career, because if it gets to be something where I'm so focused on success, I feel almost allergic to it because it reminds me too much of what things were like when I was in law. Because when I was in law, everything was so goal oriented and it was like, okay, we got to get tenure. We got to get the paper placed in this journal. We got, you know, and all this stuff. And I was very good at that because I was trained to be like the incentives were like, okay, this is how people think you're smart or whatever. And for a time that was motivating to me until I quit everything, started doing this and it's not that I'm trying to not be successful because I'm not. I want to be successful. But more, I did this because I wanted to do something that felt free, that felt like I could express myself, you know, in, without any kind of like need to do anything, right? Like, like I didn't have to cover any material in the way that I did for the bar exam or something like that. And so anything that smells of requirements is like, I hate it. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. It's like, Oh, I think I kind of feel the same way with the podcast, but I just, it's like the same thing with like reels and stuff. I'll do, I'll post clips of the podcast. Yeah. And I, I feel like I almost have to though. I feel like I'm like forced. I don't really enjoy editing it and like putting up, but then it's like, it is cool to see people's reactions if they actually like yeah. it. And then when I, when I get the clip ready, I'm like, oh, that's a cool clip. I'm, I'm excited I, to share this with the world. I would assume you feel the same yeah. way about a clip of your comedy. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, there are times when, um, look, I had a, a, a heckler hug me. I saw uh, that. I was going to ask yeah. you about that. Yeah. So that clip, I was excited to post it because I edited it because I wanted to construct for story. Right. Because there was like the moment that he did this, there were actually a few other moments that didn't make the cut because oh. I needed to show a specific arc, but he got up again. What also happened? Oh, really? That, like, yeah. But it's not that he was threatening exactly. Like I suppose like, you know, and, and for anybody listening, you know, there's a clip on my Instagram. I'm at Liz Glazer. Um, I think it is also on my Twitter and that was right before I got hacked, but you'll got to You got to <laughs> sift through a lot of crypto, which, you know, maybe is enlightening for you, but basically I was doing a show and there was a guy heckler from the audience. Would and, you call that a heckler though? Cause he yeah, fair. Like okay. a, a, an assaulter a bit um, in the sense that he, uh, I said I was gay. I was about to do, you know, a bunch of gay jokes, which I did some of. And a version of the clip had a little bit more of the jokes. But in any event, all I needed for the clip was to set up, oh, I'm a lesbian or something. It, to which this guy responded, well, you haven't met me yet. And gets up, hugs me. And then I... Didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't feel exactly threatened by him other than it's a person coming to stage. He's a man. That's those things are inherently threatening to me. I think it's fair to say, but other than that, like his energy didn't seem, he seemed very high and slower as a result of drugs. Hmm. And even though there was an element of like, what's this guy doing for sure? I don't know that I was literally scared, it, you know, and, and I, I think that that helped because then I was able to really get some zingers in, which make it into the clip, um, which I guess I won't spoil if you want to watch the clip. Um, no, your anyway, response was perfect. It was like, it was oh, really funny, you. but I then like, yeah, it was obviously you were creeped out, but yeah, wasn't he kind of like hitting on you? Isn't that basically what he was? Well, I think he knew he was kidding. 
right? Um, I think he wanted to be a part of the show. Mm. And so, yeah, I, I guess he was sitting, he did kiss me later in the night. He came up from behind me and kissed me, but I didn't want to make oh. the post or the story about it too, like, I don't know. I'm not trying to suggest that like he should really own up to this. I like, I don't care, you know, from my perspective, because I didn't feel great in response. And I also get that it's a systemic issue with like toxic masculinity. And in a moment like that, I think it's fair to say that. And also for my own life, I was like, okay, this guy sucks. I don't love it, but let me do something with my creativity, edit this clip. I sent it to a friend who does captions that I like, you know, for this purpose. Um, There are a lot of people who do great captions and I feel like some of them are better for some projects and some are better for other projects. This, I knew I wanted this one friend to edit it. And, um, and then I put it up and, and to your point, yes, it was, it was great to see the responses. Um, And, and that's like a fun moment. And also the moment of creativity of actually like editing together pieces. That's something that I want to do more of because so much of my, on stage sets, not in the album because the album is like a through line and whatever, but, but also in the album, because in the album, I do a lot of crowd work specifically with that crowd that's in that audience. But, and normally I don't have specifically that, but like a lot of times I'll have a through line where I'm talking to one person in a crowd and then something comes out as a joke and I call back to it a few times and make that person almost, I don't know, incidentally a part of the show because of the way that my brain is processing everything that's going on in the room. And I've been thinking to edit better, similar to how I did with the the assaulter guy, although there I, I knew I wanted to show certain moments. But basically the way that I started with editing that clip was let's do a cut of the set with every moment that has anything to do with him. And then we'll cut around, you know, okay, well, we want to make it to 59 seconds. So is that joke worth it? No, not really. Right. Um, et cetera. And so, you know, I don't know that they would be as shocking as that specific clip, but they could be fun, you know, cause I love, I love fun clips. Like, Jeff Arcuri, who's a wonderful comedian, who I don't I don't think I know him personally, but I love his clips online because he's such a master crowd work comedian. But he really does a lot with crowd work that's like almost like first story. And so there's a series on his Instagram where he was doing a show and there was a woman who had a dolphin laugh. I think her name was Connie. And so there's like a three part series of clips with Connie and her dolphin laugh. And it's like really funny because then you can engage a community that's following along and you almost breathe new life into a show in addition to, you know what, honestly, Chuck, I have now been monologuing for at least two and a half on why the internet is amazing after saying that I don't do it. So <laughs> listen, yeah. I'm no. convincing myself. You know what? I need to get my Twitter back. I no. have a lot to say. Well, the Instagram, I just, I just had Greg Warren. I don't know if you're familiar with him, comedian, but he was telling me like, cause I, I followed him on Instagram a few years ago and I had him on my show. And like, he said he didn't do any clips and he's like, now he's like, oh, now I'm doing the clips. I'm doing the TikToks. And he has some TikToks that have like over like a couple million views, yeah. which is insane. And yeah. I think it has helped him blow up. I feel like that's unfortunately like love it or hate it. That's part of the game. No, no, I get it. I, I don't. I mean, that's why I'm sort of, I've remained a little bit neutral on it. I'm not saying I hate it. I'm not saying I love it. And it's just like, I think that maybe some of it is like, if it happens for you that something goes super viral. I've had like in the hundreds of thousands before on a TikTok. Um, Yeah. But like, it's, you know, I would say it's the kind of thing where it's like, it's not super common. That said... You know, I'm not funny. No, I'm kidding. But um, that said, I don't like do it enough 
to reap the benefits or I haven't. And so I think that that's also part of the game is the consistency such that, you know, people know that you're posting. And so then mm-hmm. whatever, I don't know. Yeah. Like do you, do you follow Fahim? Have you, do you, you know, yeah. Fahim Manuel? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, he posts a weekly, these things yeah. like Fahim works on stuff every week and yeah. he has like 10 minutes and it's all brand new material. And he's yeah. like, Oh, I'm like workshopping this. I'm like, this is gold. This is like, yeah. this could be your special right here. And it's like every, I'm like, how does he come up with so much material? Yeah. That's gotta be hard as a comedian to come up with new stuff all the time. Right. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, it is. And also I think there's a flow with it. And I think that there's something to put it out and you'll replenish, you know, whereas if you're holding on, I don't know. I don't think this is about comedy. I think this is about literally energy, right? If you hold all your energy, then I think that that can prohibit you from having more energy. Whereas if you give away stuff, you can get more. I do believe that. So yeah, yeah, which isn't to discredit Fahim or anybody else in terms of generating material. I think it's amazing. But I also think like in terms of a principle of the universe or whatever, that that's potentially one. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. So what else? God, a lot of stuff's happened since we last talked. You've, you've, uh, you did some comedy competitions. Oh uh, yeah. That was before. Wow. Yeah, like you won the Boston one. And then, um, yeah. I heard you talking about how you, you or did the Seattle one and you didn't win, but you made a bunch of connections. So that's basically a win, right? Well, yeah. I mean, but, but, it, but it wasn't, you know, but yes, I've been back to Seattle. <laughs> I had like experience. my first, Right. I headlined my first club ever in Seattle recently. Which one? Because I'm from Seattle, if you remember that. Oh, yeah. um, Club Comedy Seattle. Oh, that must be new. Yeah, I don't think that was there. It's great. It's a great club. I really love it. And my vision has not been to tour like a ton. I've never desired that exactly. Um, I like traveling, but if I could have it my way... I would be writing for television and doing stand up in where I live, which is the New York area. And I would travel like a few times a year. So let's say 10 to 15 trips a year where I'm like, cause I do clubs, but I also, and this has been since we talked, I do a lot of law schools and law firms and synagogues. Yeah. And, those shows are super interesting and fun for me because I really have like, you know, a pretty big part of myself that's a former lawyer and law professor and an equally big part of myself, which is Jewish. Cause I not only am Jewish, but I also am married to a rabbi. I went to Orthodox Jewish day school. So I have a lot of it in me. Um, and so it's fun because at those shows, I'm able to really go hard on topics like that. And then to see what of those topics is translatable to general audiences. But it's like through, you know, talking about having been a lawyer for 45 minutes at these shows that I can then glean like, okay, you know, I actually think that that story could be framed slightly differently, but it's really about anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. Or something like that. Or it's really about like, I talk, I mean, my, my North star when I do law school shows and law firm shows is what was I too ashamed and afraid to say when I was in that world? That's like really where I start from. And it's not that different from how I start writing for anything. Cause I really talk very confessionally and personally and about, you know, shame and some stuff that's hard. That's the, the stuff that I like to bring out, you know, for comedy, but like, um, yeah, uh, as I'm, the reason I'm hesitating is I'm like, oh, what have you been up to? That's something that I wonder too, because it has been a while, but I get that that's like a different topic. So what have you been up to? Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, nobody cares about me. I have just been doing the podcast. I do. That's uh, I, the, but yeah, you're like the, <laughs> I've done like 340 of these guests. You know, what's funny. No, is, I know uh, that. Um, so, you know, one of the few people who was interested in me. <laughs> was David Duchovny. I was like, dude, he's this huge star. And yeah. I had him on and he's, he's asking me about stuff on my wall. He's like, Oh, what do you got? I'm like, 
wait, you're interested in me? I was like, you're David yeah. Duchovny. And it's like, then you realize like, that's how these people make it is because they're just so inquisitive. They're smart. They're so personable. Like he's so likable. You're like, you yeah. can see why he became a big star. He's like, I mean, yeah, he's a good looking guy too. I'm sure he, he can act. He's really smart. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, he's just so likable. But yeah, what have I been up to? I mean, gosh, the whole, like, it's funny. Last we talked, it was right before the pandemic. Right. So then that shit went down. So we caused it. We did? Yeah. By talking. By pro probably. It was the, yeah. well, yeah, it's possible. I mean, anything's, <laughs> didn't you say, no, because I heard you say you, you caused it because you were wishing the universe for like some downtime or something. Yeah. You got some downtime. So I did. It's yeah. true. But yeah, but yeah, that's okay. what I, I mean, I just, it was like the pandemic happened and then I was like, okay, uh, I guess I'll just focus on my podcast. And then I just started doing, cause I think when I, I had you on, I was doing like one a week and then I started yeah. doing like two or three a week and I've just been really trying to focus and give it like a real, like, okay, I'm yeah. really going to put all my energy into this and see what yeah. happens. And so, that's yeah, great. it's been cool. That's wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. And you know that I'm a huge fan of everything your father taught you about doing your homework. So I really appreciate that interview and now this interview. And then just to to answer the rest of the question that you asked, like, yeah, after Seattle, literally a loss in terms of competition, but I think it did teach me a lot about how to compete in comedy contests because I won mm -hmm. Boston and then I also won Ladies of Laughter, which is like another big one for yeah. women, obviously. Um, really in short succession, one after another. And it, you know, that really helped my life in a variety of ways. It's probably, I mean, arguably still one of my biggest credits. You know, a lot of times, like when someone's like, oh, what do you want me to say? I'll say, you know, one, one of those or whatever. Um, so it's it's no small thing in terms of that. And in terms of my personal achievement with it. I think like after doing Seattle, you're right that I, I did well in some ways and I made friends and have been able to go back to Seattle on the basis of the friends that I made and what they think of me and my comedy. And that's great. And it was also a real eye opener in terms of like, okay, this kind of thing, these like competitions where you do five minutes, this is strategy, right? This is what jokes can I get out as quickly as possible with as little setup, but I have to seem like a person and I have to be, you know, not a robot that's hacking my Twitter, right? Like I can't just be, I mean, I suppose you could be sort of a joke robot if that's like your persona, but I've never been that way. I've always been more conversational. And so the trick is to like figure out how to take all that and smush it into a set that's not only short, but that has to like win. <laughs> like you're being graded, right? Yeah. With points. No, I remember uh, I, w I was, uh, I used to go to a lot of Seattle comedy clubs and there was this comedian and he did this joke and I loved it. It was so funny. He said, he was like talking about how he had hit it. He's like, oh, he's like, I'm trying to make the red light when I'm driving or I'm trying to hit the green lights when I'm driving. He's like, oh no, I hit the red light. And now I gotta, now I gotta stop and stare at the homeless guy and feel bad and i was like oh that joke is so funny and i and so i saw him at a comedy competition i said oh, are you doing that joke about the homeless guy and he goes he's like he got his notes and he goes no he's like maybe i should and then he did it and it didn't do well and i was like shit uh, that felt so bad but uh, yeah that means, isn't that part of it is just like you don't know what yeah. joke's gonna do well with what audience right yeah totally and some of it is about like yeah, I mean, that's definitely true. And sometimes jokes just don't hit. And also, you know, obviously there's like a lot of work that can be done around like putting it in the right order, that it gives it the highest chance of success. And, you know, there's also something to being in an environment where people are ready to hear joke, 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 like they are in a five minutes competition. And I think the same is true you know, for a late night set, mm. because a lot of people who do late night obviously are practicing before. And what I've heard, I've never done late night. I would love to do late night. And now I'm in a phase of like kind of trying to think of, okay, well, which of my jokes would I do were I to get on late night? And I, you know, 
I don't know. I'm sure I've overthought it a million different ways. But what I've heard people say is that when they're practicing, when they're running their set that they know they're going to do on the television show that tapes in three days, let's say, and they're going around and doing it, a lot of times they bomb because those audiences are not thinking, oh, I, I'm going to hear five minutes that's like semi-autobiographical or, you know, whatever the audience for a late night set is primed to hear. So I think that in addition, it's like sometimes people can just not relate, but sometimes it's like they're just looking for different stuff, mm -hmm. right? They're they're ready to hear something that's a little bit different from the kind of thing that'll win you the Seattle International Comedy Competition or the Boston Comedy Festival or Ladies of Laughter or, you know, a Tonight Show set. Like they're just different things, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, obviously like i mean your your new special it's really interesting because it's uh i liked it but there is some stuff in there that is very dark i don't think yeah. some of those jokes would work on late night um oh but, yeah no it definitely wouldn't work on late night yeah yeah so how do you shop that uh those kind of jokes like um obviously you didn't just get up there and do i mean you've been workshopping these jokes for a long time but when you're writing yeah. a dark joke about uh you know the stillbirth of your child Mm -hmm. uh, is it something where you're like, Ooh, that's too dark. Or do you just let everything go and try it in the open mic and just see what hits? Well, if I were doing an open mic, I definitely wouldn't care, but in show settings, and it's an interesting, it's and a good question for this album in particular, because I knew that I wanted to do an album about grief. We had experienced the stillbirth of our first daughter, Leo, uh, in November of 2021, my wife and I experienced that in real life. And as a result of that experience, I didn't like that happened November 10th of 2021. I canceled everything through the end of that year because it was an extremely shocking, jarring moment, except for one set that I taped um, where I had like a lot of jokes that I had written in the hospital, basically, um, because I didn't know what else to do, you know, and, and it was like couple days after it happened, I was like, okay, I'm just going to like say, write this stuff down. And, um, and then when I got back into doing stand up, you know, like a stand up comedian with regularity, whatever. Yeah. It was hard to not only get back from grieving, which I think was part of it, but also to get those jokes to a place where people were ready to hear about them um, it didn't always work for sure. Um, but I knew that I wanted to make something about that moment. And so I, you know, like I didn't do any of that material, for example, when I was like auditioning for the seller, right. Which was like something that happened between the stillbirth and the album recording. And so it's not like in every situation I would use those jokes because those were the jokes that I was working on. I was also working kind of concurrently on other stuff, which I think I'm quite happy with how that ended up in the album because I think that one of the things that I really like about it is my own propensity for distraction, I think, is an asset on the album because it ends up being a lot of comedic relief because I end up talking about other stuff mm -hmm. that's autobiographical and that has nothing to do with grief or stillbirth as a way, not that I didn't even do it consciously, but it was kind of like everybody knew why they were there. So number one, that helps. And number two, I was doing an hour for the recording and so I wanted to do other stuff, but also other stuff kind of felt relevant to say in the moment, right? And that has nothing to do with death and nothing to do with, you know, the death of my first child. Like, it, it, yeah. So, so I guess like at the time that I was working on this material, this material comprised the difficult material and also the very benign, not having anything to do with death, let alone stillbirth, right? The other thing is I was doing a lot of like synagogues. And so 
I had some of the stuff about my dad's death that I workshopped in those settings, which I think is like, I mean, my dad was a 73 year old man. It's never, death is never something that's easy to process or talk about. But I think when you're comparing the death of a baby to the death of a 73 year old man with heart disease, there is something that's like easier to talk about, like your dad dying as opposed to a baby dying, God forbid. Um, and so I was happy to have had some of those like synagogue shows to thought to to do some of those jokes about my dad dying, which at the time were more difficult. And then once I was doing stillbirth jokes, I was like, oh, these are nothing like in terms of difficulty. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I wanted my condolences for the oh, death okay. of uh, your stillbirth, your father. And then I think I also your cat died. Yes. Mona. Mona. Yeah. yeah. So that's and, rough. It's all kind of like in a bunched. Right. And thank you. And and the purpose of having those in the album recording was really the through line being that the way that if somebody, God forbid, has a stillbirth, the grief of that is very confusing because, yeah, it's really sad. It's super shocking. It's medically scary. And also you didn't know this person necessarily like they they didn't live but they did exist and there's also this like death of hope right it's sort of this abstract grief and so i knew that i wanted to bring in mona and my dad because i had some things to say about them and also because i wanted to contrast those types of grieving with the grief that attends stillbirth because i think there's something interesting to say about grief in comparing and contrasting those different types. Yeah. Now, how do I don't know, like, or if you're a Howard Stern fan, but I don't know if you saw that movie, yeah. Private Parts, where yes. him and his wife had a miscarriage and Many then he times. talks about yeah, it on yeah. the radio. Right. And then she gets pissed. She's yes. like, that was private. So do you have to like run these kind of jokes by through your wife or like kind of like, is this okay to do? Like, how does that work? Yeah. I mean, you know, first of all, I love Howard and I saw Private Parts many times. In the theater, I saw it many times and I've seen it many times since I, I'm a big fan of Howard. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, yeah. I had little and, Mikey on my show. I don't know if you if you. Oh, familiar. really? Yeah, yeah. He's a fan oh. of my show, which I was like, what? Oh, that's, that's crazy. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Yeah, I, I love him. So, okay. Um, in terms of that with my wife, it hasn't been an issue, I think because you know, and for people who may listen to the album, like, I think the jokes are pretty tasteful, like, and I'm pretty clear to, to very much be talking about my own experience. Um, and, uh, and there's like kind of one joke that like one could argue is distasteful. And I even have a tag for it. I won't do the joke, but I will do the tag right now and you'll get it. And if somebody listens to the album, then they can get it, which is um, <clears throat> that if you're offended by that joke, I just want to remind you that it happened to me, not you. And you don't understand how good I looked in this photo. Oh, yeah, and yeah. So <laughs> That was um, so I, well, I'm not setting it up, but I'm not setting it up on purpose um, in case somebody uh, listens to it. So that's really the only joke that's like at all, like potentially offensive. I think everything I the else first opening joke was like, I was like, um, I, I laughed, but I was like, Oh gosh, that was, that was, it was great. It, I mean, I, I loved it, but I could, you know, I could see how some, but it's like you say, it's like, yeah, it, this is your experience. So yeah. And you're yeah. not making light of it. I, th I heard you talking, talking to Mike Kaplan. It was interesting how you guys talk about not making light of things, but shining yeah. light, or what was the expression? Yeah, I, I shedding light on something. And, you know, that was something that Mike said to me when I was um, doing some of this material that, because I was like, well, how am I going to do it? It's so dark. And he's like, yeah, but you're shedding light on it. And I, I, I really appreciated that. And it was very encouraging because it's not that like, I mean, you know, not that you're saying this, I feel like I'm debating someone who is fictional in this moment, but like, <laughs> like to the person, potentially the interlocutor who's like, you shouldn't 
joke about stillbirth. And by the way, that's not a, a hypothetical. Like it's literally happened to me. And and also, by the way, for me, the people who've come to me and been like, you really shouldn't joke about it uh, are people who experienced it and were like, well, I experienced it and I didn't say anything for 10 years. And I'm like, how did that work out for you? Uh, and now you're like, you know, coming at someone who is saying something about it and being like, this is bad to say. I, I, I like for me, I'm always like, I think it's better to talk about something. And I think that's true for literally everything. And for me, I mean, I talk a lot about the Holocaust in the album because I do think that like, you know, I mean, the sort of argumentative reason that it's on the album is because I have such inherited trauma. Four out of four of my grandparents survived the Holocaust. That's true. And I talk about like the, you know, intricacies of some of that trauma in funny stories and some jokes on the album. Um, but the reason that I think it's it's relevant to this set of topics for me is because I've always been so preoccupied with death and I, I really had this catch me off guard and by surprise. And so I think that that's one of the elements of stillbirth is like that it is like this, it's supposed to be the happiest moment of your life and then it's the saddest. And how confusing is that? And those are ways in which, or that is a way that it's different from like regular death in some way. Like, and again, I mean, God forbid, death is horrible surprising death is really horrible. And also there's something unique, I think, about the moment of having a baby, which you're like, oh my God, life, and I'm going to believe in God and everything's beautiful. It's sort of like being on drugs in real life kind of thing. And you're expecting this overflowing of happiness. And then you're, that specific moment is shattered by this surprise grief. And so so that's really all I'm trying to express. It's not a, this is worse than that. It's not an oppression Olympics thing. It's just the reality that it is really different, right? And sad and tragic and systemic, problematic in the healthcare system, et cetera, all of those things. And also emotionally, these are the things that it made me think and feel. And so I have had people who are like, you really shouldn't joke about it. And I, I say to those people, like, listen, if I was doing jokes that were belittling it or making a joke out of it, I get it, but I'm not. And so because of that, what I hope is not, I mean, for me, I knew I wanted to do this because it happened to me and this is how I process stuff. And also in terms of your question about my wife, she was totally fine with it. She was, you know, I mean, my wife is a rabbi. She did her Yom Kippur sermon about the experience. And so this is like collectively as a family, I think how we process stuff. We're writers and performers, essentially a rabbi is and a comedian is. And so, you know, I think that like both of us to each other are just like, go forth and like make something expressive and hopefully helpful out of this terrible experience because the experience is what it is, you know? And the other thing on the Holocaust is like, I grew up in a family because of the background with the Holocaust, like my grandparents hid. So it was a lot of secrets and hiding that were necessary in order to stay alive. You know, that's like literally what my ancestry is about. And my parents, and this is in, you know, I think that this is reasonable for them, really did a lot of that in their life. They're like, listen, we don't want to air our dirty laundry. Like that was very much kind of like the way I grew up is like, keep things a secret. You never know who's listening, who might come out to get you, right? Which makes sense given their ancestry where they were hiding from literal Nazis, yeah? But for me, the next generation, I take it in a really different way. I'm like, listen, mommy, papa, I get it. And I get what grandma and grandpa 
you know, and Baba Genya and Dede Misha were like kind of working with. And I don't feel that way, like scared of spilling secrets. And I think that that's an asset because it's kind of like, what did they hide for if only for me to be secretive? I want to be loud. I want to, you know, spill secrets that that eat me up because I don't have to hide for my literal survival, right? And so recognizing that I don't have to hide for my survival is an invitation. I take it as one to process out loud. Wow. Yeah, there's that's a lot to unpack there. That's Yeah. It's it, you're basically saying that it's helping you to talk about it and expressing. Yeah, and I what I hope is that it can be that for other people, you know, who right. have experienced loss um of all kinds, but pregnancy loss perhaps in particular. Um, and I've heard from people who have, who have said that I imagine I'll hear from people who've experienced it, who think differently, which is, you know, just the, the reality of putting out something that's like risky in some way. Yeah, no, my brother and uh, his wife, they, the, I think it was their fourth or fifth child that, uh, it wasn't a stillbirth, like they had the baby and uh, it was some sort of issue. And the baby was like an ICU for like, I don't know, a month or something. Then it passed. And I mean, it's just a terrible, terrible yeah. tragedy. But uh, my sister-in-law, I mean, she kind of like took your pro. I mean, she, she's not a comedian, but she yeah. uh, posted a lot of things on Instagram about that. And um, I don't know there was like hashtags and things. And I think she was trying to help yeah. other people cope with that by talking about it. Cause it is yeah. a hard thing to talk about. It's interesting. You say, there's some people that said I didn't talk about it for 10 years. I'm like, wow, that's like the other end of the extreme, I, I think. So I don't know. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I really don't think that there's like a right way and a wrong way. I guess the only thing I perceive to be kind of wrong in those situations is I don't, I know that I wouldn't come at someone and be like, hi, I think you're doing it wrong. I wouldn't do that. Right. Uh, but That's a good point. Yeah. But I mean, you know, everybody has a right to say whatever, you know, that's the beauty of it. But yeah. So like for somebody, cause I, this was my thing, like, and I think I feel this way about most grief, but especially something like that is that I was just like, as a person like, okay, this is my brother. Mm -hmm. How do I, what do I do? Like, how do I support him? <laughs> Do I, you know, it's the thing like where I go, I play it out in my head. I'm like, okay, maybe I need to give them space. And it's, and then it's like, no, maybe like I shouldn't give them space. Maybe I should reach out and then uh, like play all these scenarios. I'm like, I don't know yeah. what the right move is. Yeah. And I, I don't know that I do either. And I think, you know, different people are different, you know? Um, and first of all, I'm very sorry for your brother and sister-in-law and your family. That's thank you. Yeah. really a terrible loss. It was. Uh, yeah. So, um, and I, yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's anything that is the way in grief. I'm certainly no expert on this or much else. Um, but I guess like I, I, for a time in my life, I feel like when I was still practicing, not that this has anything to do with law, but like for whatever, I think I was just a little less comfortable in myself that I was always worried about saying the wrong thing. And I stopped worrying about that. Like, how do you I do that? This, this is going to be gold right here. This is what I need. Oh. to learn. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, just because like, I, I really trust that I am a good person and a nice person. You are. And thanks. And you Chuck, truly. Um, trying, trying to be, <laughs> but like, I, I don't, I guess maybe in the old days when I was trying to say the right thing, I think rather than just say something expressing love, I tried to put it through a filter of like, well, what should I say in this moment? And I stopped. I just am like, this is my friend. This is my family member. This is my loved one. I'm going to be here. I'm going to like, I don't know 
just say what's honest for me in this moment and like listen you're a great listener you know like i i think i'm a good listener too and i think that i turn that on when someone's grieving for sure and then you know like i share i try to about what's happening for me uh usually because i feel like sometimes people are like oh well i should just like keep I either shouldn't talk about the grief at all, or I should only talk about the grief. And it's like, well, what if you just like said something innocuous that happened to you earlier today? And the person will interrupt you with stories of their loved one or whatever, because it's really just, I think, creating an environment where someone's like comfortable and something feels a little bit normal. Like I remember from Tig's Live album that it was like when she had the cancer diagnosis, people were like afraid to say what was happening in their day because they would be like, ugh, there was such traffic. And then it's like, oh, well, I was it wasn't cancer. And she's like, just tell me about your dumb day. Like, that's what I want, you know? Mm. And I I think, I mean, everybody's different. Like that said, somebody could be like, well, why were you doing this? And it's like, I don't know. I think that that person is probably like gonna get mad at you no matter what, if that's <laughs> like the attitude. That's yeah. my take. But like, you know, I, I really try not to worry about saying the wrong thing. Is that, are you saying for grief or are you saying for yeah. everything in life? No, no, for grief. Okay. Um, and, and like hard moments, like okay. how do you, how are you going to be there for someone in a hard moment? And I think the answer is really so simple, which is just be there. Oh, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I was going to ask you this about the special too, because, um, one of the things you mentioned is a uh, uh, Shiva and oh, I, had to, yeah. I had to Google that. I was like, I, don't oh. I dated a Jewish girl for like a year, but I didn't know. So the Shiva is it just so people know. So they get the joke. It's yeah. a week long. This is a week long mourning period uh, yeah. in Judaism for first degree relatives. There's mm-hmm. like a ritual. Yeah. Yeah. So Shiva is it Shiva. Trans- sorry. Not, Oh no, it's fine. Okay. Um, translates to the word seven and yeah, it's a week of, of sitting and kind of getting people who are expressing their condolences. Mm-hmm. Um, and over the pandemic, there was like Zoom Shiva. Um, Jessica Kirsten has like really funny jokes about Zoom Shiva for, I believe it's her father's um, death and, that happened during the pandemic. We also, my dad died during the pandemic and we also had Zoom Shiva. Um, but I didn't have specific jokes about it, but, um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's just sitting and like being with the person. And in terms of like the commandments about the rituals, which, you know, because it's a religious thing, it's like, there are people who, um, well, this is funny. This isn't my story, but it's a funny story. So there's a thing you're supposed to say, especially if you're Orthodox Jewish to someone at a Shiva which it starts with hamakom yanachem and it's like this this Hebrew phrase that basically means like you should be comforter comforted rather among the mourners of Zion and whatever you're supposed to say this and so people who are really observant <laughs> sometimes will like hunt you down to like be like hamakom yanachem da, 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 whatever and like then you're like oh, okay whatever <laughs> Fine. so but um my friend Robin uh, <laughs> told me this story and I don't even know if it happened to her or whatever, but it was like someone who went to a Shiva and it was like an Orthodox Shiva there. People were saying that phrase at people, right. Who were mourners. Okay. And the person was like, Oh, I don't, I don't know the phrase. What is it? <laughs> and so somebody says to this person, well, they have a sign behind the mourners you know so let's say they're sitting near the fireplace on the mantle it's a sign that says just read the sign just do that and i guess in addition to the the sign that says the phrase there was also another sign right behind and so this not as observant person goes up to a mourner and says if anybody has left a tan coat or an umbrella, please see Carol. 
<laughs> in the parking lot. <sighs> and, you know, I don't even know. It's such a good story that okay. I Wait, almost... is that a real story? I feel like that's right. like a good... It yeah. sounds like no, a street no, joke from, from the Catskills. Like, it's so good. And I can't even remember if it if it's something that happened to, you know, a person that she knows or if it was, like, lore. But it's amazing, regardless. Mm. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, yeah, the special is funny. I love the Facebook joke, um, the details of the people in the audience. You, the lesbian jokes are funny, but now this is interesting. I want to ask you about this. You use a yeah. derogatory slur of lesbians. I do. Black. Now, how I, is that? Is that like black people using the N word? Like, how do you get away with that? Or like, do some people get mad at that for you saying that? Or, um, I think because it's a, I'm a lesbian, and b, it's directed at a literal cat in the joke um i think it's fine i i had a moment where i was like should i take this out and then i was like nah i'm not gonna because <laughs> i don't it's a lot of a lot of that part like i hadn't said well i no, that that one i did say but some of that stuff is really um of the moment because it was like connected to literal people in the literal audience yeah, no, that's crazy how many people that you knew were, I mean, you, did you like kind of like hound people or you just send out the invite and these are the people that showed up? Yeah, these are the people that showed up. And so, you know, I think I did a good job of um, publicizing it. And also, you know, it was this momentous day. And so I think that I capitalized on that in the sense that people might have, you know, shown support because it was the one year anniversary of when this happened. Right. And so, you know, maybe that helped too. I, I mean, I, I think that like everybody in the audience might have also shown up because I was taping, uh, no matter what, what else, what also happened. But I think that like the element of like, okay, this is a day we would have taken you out to dinner or we would have done something anyway. And then we're doing this like kind of made sense. Yeah, that's cool. So is it, um, so I listened to the album. Is there going to be, yeah. I mean, I saw clips online though. Is there going to yeah. be a full video uh, release as well? So there's not going to be yet a full video of the set that is the album. What there will be is a documentary about the making of this and the year um, of the, well, it's a little bit more than that actually, because so basically I was supposed to tape an hour with the same company that recorded me for this before we had the stillbirth right. because Karen was pregnant. That's my wife. And um, I was under contract with Blonde Medicine, who's a great album recording, like comedy record label. And I was going to do a, an hour of jokes about my wife is pregnant and I'm expecting to be a parent. And I was supposed to tape that on December 5th of 2021. It was called Born Sorry, because that's a punchline of a joke. And then everything happened. We had the stillbirth. Our life was upended. And I was still not only under contract, because I mean, it's not about the contract. I, I adore Blonde Medicine and I wanted to record with them. But I was like, well, I want to tape an hour about this now that this has happened, but obviously it was different jokes. The whole, everything about it really was different. Um, however, or also I was like, when, when we lost the baby, I was like, well, do I have maybe three weeks after I was like, do I have those? My wife is pregnant jokes that I'm never going to do again um, on tape. And I, I did, you know, because either I was taping or you go to a show and somebody has a fancy camera they're trying out, whatever it is, that I had footage of me doing most of those jokes. Hmm. Um, and I also had footage of doctor's appointments because I tape a lot, like, of my own life. Um, I have footage of the actual transfer because we were on FaceTime because of COVID. So I have, like, the footage of, like, the embryo going in microscopically to wow. my wife and I also three weeks ish after the stillbirth, I had three camera people tape me doing 
the jokes that I wrote in the hospital three weeks after it happened. And it was a totally different vibe, probably closer energetically to how I started this Zoom, okay? Because I was deeply in mourning at that time. Um, I'm not a mourning person. That's a pun. Uh, <laughs> so I don't normally think of those. But um, but anyway, so so I taped that. And then I have other life footage, whatever. Uh, and then I taped this hour and we have video of it. And so the goal is to have a documentary entitled Still Born Sorry, which of course is another pun, oh. which is about how I was supposed to tape Born oh. Sorry and then it turned into this other album. And so for that, the goal is not to have like an hour set at the end because it's part of a larger work that includes like life footage and other sets with other material. And then this right after the baby died set, right? And then a year out. Um, and also hopefully, uh, so my wife is pregnant now and do very- Oh, easy. congratulations. Yeah. Wow, that's Thank exciting. You. And so the Rainbow goal- Rainbow baby, that's uh, what they call it. Yes, it is. Um, and so, you know, of course we hope everything mm -hmm. is very different and better, et cetera. Um, and I also want to be clear that like one of the things with stillbirth and rainbow babies that I find it's, it's like, it all makes sense. And also it's like, we don't replace people, right? Like, it's not like this baby replaces Leo. Um, and I think in terms of like the story, it's a nice, hopefully, you know, way to um, tell the story of, our lives with respect to these events mm -hmm. um hopefully you know not not just for the purpose of the documentary or the special or the album but rather you know for um just life reasons we want i mean we wanted a baby like we got into this because we wanted a live one like you know so um and again i mean there is this way that like leo our first daughter who knows why these things happen? I certainly don't. But, um, you know, she she was perfect in her own way, in the way that we all are. And this was a terrible tragedy. And so, you know, I want to make this because it's like all of those babies, I don't, I just, I want to speak for them almost. Um, and I hope you know, that through the album and also the documentary that hopefully will come out, you know, a few months after the album comes out, um, that I can do that, you know, or my best effort at doing that. Um, but yeah, like, I, I just wanted to make something positive. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, and, and it's probably, probably cathartic to do a lot of this and to do the jokes. Yeah. And to talk yeah. About yeah. And the special, it's, I feel like it's kind of like a roller coaster, which I think makes it better because you're like, oh, wow. You're like, you're feeling like sadness. And then all of a sudden, and then you like, you break it up and you make me laugh. And I think that's like so yeah. brilliant. I mean, that's what I loved about, um, I know he's canceled or kind of did some bad things, but Louie, like the show yeah. Louie, I don't know if you ever watched that, but of course I, I loved did. about that show yeah. is that it was so, it would be so serious. And you're like, oh yeah. my God. And then he would just boom, make you laugh. And you're just like, Oh my God, that's so brilliant. And yeah. I think that's just how life is. I, I like that kind of like art. I do too. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't know Louis personally and uh, you know, yeah, I get, he did bad things. And also I loved the show Louis. Me too. Yeah. I tried to like kind of model my podcast after that in the sense that I want to talk about things that are really serious and really deep and then also like really light and really yeah. funny things and just kind of be all over the place. I support it. And, and you, and I think <laughs> you're, you. no, truly, I think you're doing an amazing job. I've said it, you know, off the air many times and I've meant it every time. Truly. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. I know it meant a lot when yeah. I, I like, I listened back to that first interview and I, I cringed a little, like not at you, just more myself. I was like, Oh, like, 
you know, listening to old, it's probably the same. Like if you watch old stand up, sure. you're like, oh, I'm so much better than, than this yeah. now. But yeah, it's cool that when someone supports you early, like that means a lot. Oh yeah. Well, same. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Like you have a lot of, I was like looking at your followers on Instagram. Like, wow, you have so many comedians, mm. uh, big comedians that, that follow you, like that oh. you've connected with over the years. It must be like, yeah, cool. Yeah. I mean, I feel very lucky. I remember when I first got into it, all I wanted was a mentor. And that's how that Joan Rivers story that's on the album arose because I never meant to do comedy. And when I started doing comedy, I was like, okay, well, I need to find somebody who can be my mentor. I know Joan Rivers from the Muppets. What about her? And, (laughs) but now, you know, I feel like the universe or, you know, whatever, whoever, um, has brought into my world, like the fact that like, you know, Mike Kaplan, I mean, could anyone ask for a better mentor and friend than that? Maria Bamford, same thing. And it's like, you got to open for her. That's so cool. Yeah, It is. And did you reach out to her? How did that one come out? Oh, we've been friends for a while. And, um, and then she through comedy and, and then she like, you know, has been a real supporter and follower of my career And then like she was coming through Fairfield, Connecticut last June, like a year ago, June, and was like, hey, are you anywhere near Fairfield, Connecticut? And I was like thinking like, yeah, do you need a place to stay? Like, do you need a ride? You know, (laughs) and then she was like, oh, uh, I'm fine. But do you want to do five minutes? And I was like, yeah, obviously. So then I did. And then she had me open for her for two dates that she was on the East Coast and those were amazing. Um, one of one of them was at SOPAC, which is the theater that's like right near where I live, um, the South Orange Performing Arts Center, which is an amazing theater that I now, like because of that night, got to know the executive director and am able to like do so many more things at that theater. So it's really amazing how, you know, kind of like you just plot away and like this thing leads to that thing leads to the other thing, um, hopefully. You know, but I think if you stay a course, then that, that reality allows, is allowed for. Yeah. Cause now, so you're in New York now, cause you were, you were in New York and then didn't you go to LA and now, so now you're back to New York. Yeah. I'm in New Jersey, uh, Jersey. being honest, which we don't have to be, you could say New York, but um, (laughs) no, I'm in New Jersey. And um, how far are you from like Manhattan? Like if you wanted to do like the comedy cellar or something. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's like 33 minutes on a train. It's pretty, it's very easy. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I grew up living in a suburb of New York that is in New Jersey. So I am familiar with that like way. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, I was in LA, I was in LA for three years and I knew that because my thing with, with going to LA was, I was like, if I can go to law school for three years, I can go to Los Angeles for three years. And so I knew that I was leaving after three years and I left during the pandemic, but that was also when my lease was up. So it was like, you know, whatever. I mean, I left a week before I thought I was going to, because my dad died. And so, you know, and my dad dying obviously affected my life a lot, but not my travel plans as much. Hmm. Um, So yeah. So did you meet people, you met people from New York and LA then? Cause I mean like, like mm-hmm. Scott, uh, I, don't, I never how to know how to say his last name. Is it Sice or Cease? Oh, he Scott calls, Cease. Yeah. yeah. That guy, that, that, he does those Ikea TikToks. I love yeah. that guy. And that guy follows you. And then this guy yeah. that I, um, I found on TikTok, Austin Nasso, who does uh-huh. amazing impressions. I don't know why uh-huh. he's not on SNL. I think he's better than SNL. He follows you. Uh-huh. Uh, some like WWE CJ, CJ Perry. Yeah. He follows yeah. you. <laughs> so CJ, I met in acting class, Scott, I met on a show at Caroline's when it still existed. RIP. Um, Austin, I don't know that I, I will have to check because I'm not sure where we met. Um, you know him though? You know I what I'm talking about? I think I do. Oh, I'm he not, does great. Yeah, I believe movies. you. I believe you. I'll have to get to know him. Yeah. He does like great. He does Trump and Biden and like, ah. he, he does like a bunch like, and there's okay. they're, like I said, I think they're better than the like people on SNL. Yeah. That's just so amazing about TikTok and all this stuff. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, and that's like, uh, it's inspiring to see people who really make use of the media that way. 
Yeah, it's crazy. Dylan Mulvaney follows you. Oh, you Dylan. Know? Yes. I, mean, I know Dylan like, from acting. Yeah, because she's like, she's a big name, right? Yeah. I don't think two months ago, yeah. anybody knew who she was. Now it's like, right. She's in the news. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's very much in the news. Um, and she's a very wonderful person. Yeah. And then um, who's this uh, Yellowstone actress, Hassie? Harrison. Oh yeah. Yeah. We know each other through a mutual friend in LA who had a party and there, <laughs> it was like, we met at the party. We got along, but also there was this picture of like her and another friend who was also like, you know, a very blonde, like Hollywood, like looks like they're supposed to be there. And then I was in the background of the photo and I was just like, you know, going like that, <laughs> looking at my friend who took the photo. And I, I think, and then I posted that photo and I think I wrote the caption of like, invite me to your Hollywood party. This is my vibe or something silly like that, because it was just so like, that would be me is like lurking in the background. Like, Hey, I'm also here. Um, and I think that she and I became internet friends after I posted that because we met at that party and we're in the same photo. That's super cool. Do you think that stuff helps you like making these connections? Uh, like, I mean, Maria Bamford reached out to you and uh, asked yeah. you to open like, yeah, I think, I mean, I think, you know, ultimately I really am just trying to like be the best, not only comedian cause yeah, but I'm really trying to express the most me thing in the way that allows people in front of me to get it and me the most. That's really what I'm trying to do. And it seems that comedy is the medium through which to do that. But I guess, and by the way, I have a heart out at 1215. I should have mentioned that before. Oh, sorry. I'm very yeah. sorry. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, but I think like, whenever something is all about like, oh, this is the craft. It's like, it's, yes, it is. Like I am trying to be the best comedian, but it's like, I'm not trying to put together a string of my best jokes just because I want to showcase that I can be the best at comedy. Because to me, that's kind of like what I was talking about at the beginning, the sort of addiction and obsession with skill and craft to the exclusion of the person. And to me, it smells too much like what I did in law. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't like it as much because I'm just like, yeah, well, when I was a law professor, I was trying to write an article that gets the highest place journal. I was trying to, I was visiting at another law school, trying to like get up the rankings, like anything that's like that. I, I kind of, it's hard for me to really get into it, you know, because it's just too similar. And I'm just like, I want to, you know, be, I don't know. I mean, maybe it sounds dumb and idealistic, but like, I really want to be me in front of people who I don't know yet, but who feel like they know me. And if I met them, I probably want to, be best friends with them. That's what I that, want. That's super genuine. And like, I, I think that's the whole point of life is just to be happy. Yeah. So yeah. why not do what makes you happy and try to do less of the stuff that doesn't make you happy. I guess my thing is I always just try to balance it with like, like the, like that we were talking about earlier, like, like things like with the editing and the video and audio yeah. clips. I'm like, Oh, I hate this crap, but I'm trying to just do it because I know it's important because I know it's going to help me get where I really yeah. want to go, where I, then and I can hire someone to do it for me. Cause I hate it so much. Yeah. Right. And I believe that you'll get there. Um, and soon because you're doing a fantastic job, Chuck, truly. Thank you. So I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So are you. I love the special. I hope Thank it blows you. up. People should check it out. And I want, I want to make sure I say the right name. It's called a very particular experience. Yep. It's going to yep. come out on, is it May 12th? Is that you're right. Yes. I got it. So, yeah. and then I, as you remember, I always uh, promote ending uh, a chip from end and promoting a charity. I think last time we talked about <laughs> donating to the ACLU. Do you want people to donate to that? Or is there another yeah. one? I mean, so, so I gave all of the proceeds from the album recording to March of Dimes, a hundred percent of them. Wow. Um, that's generous. 
Yeah. Well, I really, I mean, March of Dimes does great work on pregnancy loss, um, okay. among other things. So okay. yeah, that's what I'm going to promote. Okay. Awesome. Well, uh, I'll let you get back to your, uh, thank next you. thing at heart out. And, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, thank you, Chuck. yeah, people should follow you on Instagram, uh, pre-order the album, especially if yeah. it's money is going to March of Dimes. That's amazing. And, yeah, uh, yeah. I look forward to seeing this TV show that you're going to be writing. That's about Oh, thanks, that. Chuck. Is that, you're still working on that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, okay. and the, the scene of the 18 espresso shots is helpful because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that one today. Okay, are you, now are you, I know we've got a, two minutes, but real quick, yeah. like, would you, now obviously you want to star in it, or would you be open, yeah. open to having someone else star in it? Or is it kind of like with like Rocky, I don't know if you know the story of that, Sylvester Stallone wrote it and he's like, he, I think he had to like take a pay cut or something to star in it. Like, yeah. how do you, do you have a. Yeah, I want to be in it. Uh, to me, that is the most fun. If I would take a pay cut. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay. what am I getting paid right now to be in my own show? Nothing. So yeah, uh, yeah I'm happy to take a pay cut. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope it happens. And uh, oh, thank you so much that. and come back on the thank show you. anytime. Oh, All right. I love you. Thank All you. Right. See you later. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. Great stuff from Liz Glazer. Uh, make sure to pre-order her stand-up album, A Very Particular Experience, out May 12th. And the proceeds go to the March of Dimes, which is very cool and very generous of Liz. Uh, so make sure to support her also by following her on social media. It's just some very funny clips on uh, there of her stand-up. And of course, as always, liking, sharing, commenting on social media and YouTube for the guest and this episode can help us both out. So I appreciate all your support for my guests and my show. Have a great day. Shoot for the moon.